Hello, I'm Ali Chowdhury. I'm the head of non-ionizing radiation based in the medical physics department within the University Hospitals Leicester NHS Trust. I have a number of responsibilities within the trust, one of them being the MET EMR physicist and UHL Trust uh, magnetic resonance safety expert. I'm also a clinical scientist and involved in various research projects related to MRI. In this lecture, I will give an introduction to MRI. Magnetic resonance imaging is a huge subject, so, so this lecture will be an introduction covering only the most basic information related to uh, physics, scanner hardware, image interpretation, applications and safety. MRI techniques are based on the phenomenon of nuclear magnetic resonance, NMR. NMR can be accurately explained using quantum mechanics, but the basic principles for imaging can often be described using classical mechanics. A simple model of an atom shows that it consists of a nucleus that is made of protons and neutrons, and the nucleus is surrounded by a cloud of electrons. MRI can be accomplished by detecting signals that originate from the nucleus of certain types of atoms that possess a quantum mechanical property called spin. The nucleus of an atom has a positive charge, and if it has spin, then the nucleus has an associated magnetic field or magnetic moment. Based on a classical mechanics description, atoms that have nuclear spin act like tiny bar magnets. If we place tiny bar magnets near another large magnet, then the tiny bar magnets will tend to align themselves with the large magnet. If we then transmit radio waves into the sample of nuclei, then we can stimulate energy changes that we can then detect. Radio waves are non-ionizing radiation, so MRI is considered to be, an, to be a non-invasive imaging uh, method. The nucleus of a hydrogen atom is particularly important for MRI because the body contains water and fat molecules uh, that contain hydrogen atoms. The nucleus of a hydrogen atom is a proton, and because the proton has spin, it acts like a tiny biomagnet, so we can detect signals using MRI from hydrogen nuclei. So in an MRI experiment, we may imagine the body contains lots of tiny bar magnets. When the subject is placed in a very strong external magnet, the tiny bar magnets in the body tend to align themselves with the direction of the external large static magnetic field. We can then apply radio waves to change the orientation of the tiny magnets. After we stop emitting radio waves, the tiny magnets will tend to return to their original orientations and return to thermal equilibrium and energy levels in a process that we call relaxation. The relaxation process can be described mathematically and is characterized by exponential functions with time constants T1 and T2. Different tissues have different T1 and T2 relaxation time constants. Images can be produced that have signal intensity that are dependent on the T1 and T2 relaxation times. So a very basic description of an MRI acquisition is as follows. We first place a person into a large magnet. We then transmit radio waves into the person. The radio waves interact with the hydrogen nuclei within the body tissues of the person, stimulating changes in the energy. We can think of the radio waves causing changes in the orientation of tiny bar magnets within the body relative to the main static magnetic field direction. This then results in radio waves being emitted from the person which can then be detected. We can obtain spatial information by manipulating our external large magnetic field while we detect the radio waves. The radio waves are then stored in a large computer and after completing all the different magnetic field changes to get all the necessary signals, the data is processed and reconstructed with the uh, computer. So MRI is not a snapshot imaging method. To obtain good quality images using MRI, it is necessary for the subject 
in the scanner to remain stationary during the entire data acquisition procedure, which can take several minutes. The MRI scanner consists mainly of a very large magnet. In clinical MRI, the large magnet is usually a superconducting magnet that produces magnetic fields, typically of one and a half Tesla or three Tesla. So it is approximately 60,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. The superconducting magnet of an MRI is always uh, on even when the scanner is not being used, and this has safety implications that we will discuss later. The MRI scanner also has radio frequency coils to transmit and receive signals. There are also magnetic field gradient coils within the MRI system that are switched on and off rapidly to allow spatial information to be collected for producing the images. Most clinical MRI systems have a wide horizontal bore Patients can then be placed onto a bed and the whole uh, patient can then be driven into the magnet bore to scan any part of the body as necessary. Uh, different RF coils can also be used to acquire images from different anatomical uh, regions. Different MRI sequences are used to transmit and detect radio waves. The main types of MRI sequences are called gradient echo, spin echo, and inversion recovery sequences. The main parameters within a sequence are the flip angle, echo time, and repetition time. Different MRI sequences and parameters can be selected by the scanner operator to produce different tissue signal contrast in the images that are then dependent on T1 or T2 or proton density weightings. In MRI images, the brighter the regions in the image, the higher is the signal intensity detected. The sequence type determines the type of image that is produced. There are many types of images that can be produced by MRI to distinguish and examine different types of tissues. The three main types of MRI images will be discussed in the next slide. Signal intensity of MRI images are dependent on the local magnetic fields that the hydrogen nuclei experience, as well as the density of the hydrogen nuclei within the tissue. The biophysical environment of the water and fat molecules in the tissue affects the magnetic fields experienced by hydrogen nuclei. So different tissues have different T1 and T2. There are three basic types of images that can be produced by MRI. These are T1 weighted images, T2 weighted images, and proton density weighted images. T1 weighted images are optimized to show differences in the T1 relaxation times. The T2 weighted images show best the differences in tissue T2 relaxation times, and the proton density weighted images distinguish best across different tissues that have differences in the tissue proton densities. In this slide, we can see two different types of images. The image at the top is a T1 weighted image and the image below is a T2 weighted image. The T1 weighted image predominantly shows signal from fat because fat molecules produce highest signal intensity in T1 weighted images and water produces weak signals in T1 weighted images. On the other hand, the T2 weighted images show high signal from both fat and water. In addition to the main T1 and T2 image types that can be used to examine the anatomy, it is also possible to produce vascular and flow images uh, using magnetic resonance and geography uh, methods. Uh, perfusion and diffusion imaging can be carried out using MRI and so can uh, uh, functional uh, MRI uh, that can be used to map brain activity. Uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopy uh, can be uh, carried out to uh, measure brain metabolites. In T1 weighted images of the brain, grey matter appears the brightest. On the other hand, cerebral spinal fluid, CSF, 
which is composed mainly of water, appears dark. In T2-weighted images of the brain, white matter and CSF appear brightest because water produces high signal intensities in T2-weighted images. In this sagittal T1-weighted image of the knee, the tissue with the bone marrow appears bright because it contains fat molecules that produce high MR signals in T1-weighted images. On the other hand, the bone cortex does not contain fat, so that appears dark. To obtain better visibility of the bone cortex, CT or plain x-rays can be used. Antenatal MRI can be carried out. Uh, T2-weighted sagittal and coronal images in this slide sh clearly show multiple cysts in the left uh, fetal kidney. MRI scans of the breast can be acquired to provide supplementary information to mammography and ultrasound. MRI is highly sensitive for detection of breast cancer with moderate specificity. Evolving methods including multiple or multi-parametric MRI scanning are improving sensitivity and specificity in uh, breast cancer detection to provide improved information for lesion morphology and function. MRI is also used for imaging implant ruptures and image dense breast tissue in younger women, particularly in cases with negative mammography cancer detection. MRI can produce superb images of the heart anatomy and function, incorporating cine type uh, sequences to capture heart motion. Uh, cine studies are typically obtained by repeatedly imaging the heart at a single slice location throughout the cardiac cycle. The myocardium viability post-infarction can also be assessed using cardiac MRI with late gadolinium contrast enhancement. Although the use of contrast agents is not essential for MRI, contrast agents can provide additional information in the images if it is used. The most common contrast agent is gadolinium, which is a paramagnetic substance that produces very high signal in T1 weighted images. The gadolinium contrast agent can be intravenously injected or it can be injected directly into the body part, uh, for example, as, such as a joint. Uh, therefore, pre and post gadolinium T1 weighted images are compared to assess the signal enhancement from the tissues. Abnormal or cancerous tissues are often more vascular compared to healthy tissues, so uh, the abnormal tissues appear more bright on post gadolinium images. Artifacts are features in the image that do not represent the actual physical reality. Uh, there are many uh, MRI artifacts and understanding the physics related to the image acquisition helps to understand how best to eliminate or reduce the artifact. Uh, image noise is the most common uh, type of artifact, uh, but there are other types of artifacts, um, for example, susceptibility artifacts, Moya fringes, herringbone artifact. In fact, there are many, many MRI uh, artifacts. Uh, we're not going to really be able to cover all the different types. However, uh, just going uh, back to image noise, um, it's uh, often seen in the background in the images and uh, can be uh, produced with because of the electrical um, uh, circuitry within the scanner itself. Uh, the uh, susceptibility artifacts that can occur because there are some kind of, for example, metal a metal implant or dental brace, surgical screw, uh, or even a metal coin stuck inside the MRI bore that can lead to uh, a susceptibility type of artifact. Uh, then we've got, uh, uh, for example, Moya fringes. Uh, these can occur if there is a, a magnetic field in homogeneities uh, and can usually be seen, especially in gradient echo type sequences. Uh, then uh, another example uh, would be herringbone artifact. Uh, that uh, looks a bit like a herringbone uh, pattern and um, it's also called a spike artifact. Ba basically it occurs when there is some kind of uh, electrical discharge or a spark, uh, for example occurring from the electrical um, connections within the scanner or it could even ha happen because there's a light bulb, uh, certain types of light 
bulbs um, in this uh, scanner room, if they blow, for example, could uh, produce a spike artifact or a herringbone artifact in the image space. There are three main hazards associated with MRI. First, there is the large static magnetic field produced by the superconducting magnet. In clinical MRI, the static magnetic field is usually one and a half tesla or three tesla, and this magnetic field remains uh, switched on within the MR exam room uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The risk and environment with a very strong static magnetic field is if there are any ferromagnetic materials that may enter into the environment, then they can be pulled by the strong magnet and the object then acts like a projectile with the risk of causing serious injury to anyone in the pathway of the projectile. And it can cause serious damage to the MRI scanner. While the MRI scanner is being used for scanning, there is also the high amount of acoustic noise from radiant coils uh, that are being switched on and off. And uh, the acoustic noise can be over 85 decibels and quite often over 100 decibels. And that risks uh, hearing uh, damage uh, to anyone that might be in the MRI environment during the scanning. Unless, of course, they have uh, hearing protection. There is also the radio frequency radiation that is being emitted and that has associated uh, heating and uh, the risk of burns for the person being scanned if they have implants or if, if uh, they are not correctly positioned in the scanner. MRI safety rules must be followed uh, correctly and before anyone enters into the MR environment they must remove all ferromagnetic uh, materials from them and they must have uh, screening carried out uh, by an authorised MR uh, person. Before a patient can have a MRI scan, a MRI safety questionnaire must be completed to screen for any MRI contraindications. Any implants, for example, aneurysm clips, uh, neurostimulators, heart pacemakers, shrap shrapnel injury, must first be properly risk assessed because there is the risk of the implant moving, hence causing injury. There is also the risk of burns occurring to tissues adjacent to an implant if correct procedures are not, are not taken. There is a risk of implant itself malfunctioning if the implant is electrically, mechanically or magnetically active. Some implants can be scanned with appropriate control measures or precautions, but there are some implants that will be an absolute contraindication to MRI, particularly uh, implants containing ferromagnetic materials. The use of MRI contrast agents also has additional risk, particularly for patients with impaired kidney function and uh, pregnant patients. In this final slide, I'm just going to summarise some of the advantages and disadvantages of MRI. The main advantages for MRI include uh, the fact that it uses non-ionizing radiation. We can acquire multiple plane images without uh, repositioning the patient. Uh, we can get superior soft tissue contrast uh, compared to CT scans. Um, there are many types of image contrast reflecting tissue biophysical and chemical properties. And uh, we can acquire both quantitative and functional and morphological information from the images. Some of the disadvantages of MRI are uh, MRI scans are more expensive compared to CT. Uh, MR images can be uh, uh, can have very many artifacts that must be recognized and uh, minimized. MRI scanning is not safe for patients with certain types of MR unsafe implants and strict safety rules and screening is required.